Good morning, everyone. I love being at Verge. I love Joel's vision for bringing us together to think about investing at the intersection of sustainability and technology. As one who joins you in that pursuit, it's certainly an honor to be here to share some insights of experience. About five years ago, I was still at the Department of Energy when the International Energy Agency came through with a blunt proclamation. They said, look, we need to completely eliminate fossil fuel use by the year 2075 worldwide. Well, friends, that's within the span of my lifetime. And I thought to myself, wow, and what else? Oh, they said, there's more. We need a trillion dollars of clean energy investment every year for decades. Is that all? Oh, no, there's more. We actually need, in order to get to a 100% fossil-free future, some way to reach everyone everywhere. Because we can't reach 100% with only half the people. Now, you heard how we have struggled with economic inclusion, and I've given that some thought. Why is it that we struggle on that front? One of the reasons is that financing policies are a very powerful tool for mobilizing capital, but they also patrol who has access to it. And for good reasons, common financing instruments like loans and leases systematically disqualify people based on criteria like income, credit score, renter status. That's why I was captivated by the report of a national lab that found in Kansas a working model of a more inclusive financing solution called pay as you save. It allowed the utility to offer a terms of service agreement that would allow the utility to invest in anything on the customer side of the meter and make that option available to any customer regardless of their income, credit score, or renter status. I recognize that as having the potential to bridge the clean energy divide and unlock tapped, untapped potential in the markets that we really needed to get to where we know we need to go. Why do I find that so compelling? I think our challenges require a rapid response. And in order to get to scale and speed, we're going to need something approximately this size, the size of the electric power sector, so big you can see it from space. Now that becomes handy when you start to see two convergent trends on the horizon. One is more field experience that's inspiring confidence in inclusive financing using utility uh, business models. And two is the plummeting cost of batteries that's drawing electric vehicles closer to cost parity with their fossil fuel alternatives on a life cycle basis. Here, I want to show you why I think this is compelling by giving you both a bird's eye view and then a specific example. Here you see the federal outlook for the carbon footprint of the energy sector in the United States. And this, you see, is the 2050 target if we want a hope of stabilizing warming at 2 degrees. How do we get from that top line to the dash line, driving 80% of the carbon out of our footprint? Well, you can start by shutting down every fossil fuel power plant in the country. You'll get that far. Virtually every scenario for stabilizing climate change Next requires driving oil out of the transportation sector by driving vehicles into the electric power sector. It accounts for about two-thirds of the distance between that green line and the red line. Well, what is that really worth to the utility sector? Well, the Brattle Group expects that just the electrification of the transportation sector could double the outlook for annual sales growth for utilities. It's worth hundreds of billions of dollars, a growth opportunity coveted by utility CEOs everywhere. So EV Transit, it's a good opportunity to go from 1% of market share to saturation. And we want the power sector to be that successful. Currently, we're we are relying on customers to cobble together rebates, loans, leases, and tax credits in order to fuel our sales. Utilities do want to make it easier. They keep proposing to try to defray costs on the customer side of the meter. But sometimes they're inclined to propose that they should have expenses that are in spread across everybody or extend their monopoly, equally objectionable and unjustified. 
That's why I'm interested in innovative financing solutions. And I think that we should actually look at a case example. This is an electric transit bus. <laughs> and electric transit buses are actually a great place to start. Big batteries, big fleets, relatively small number of players, a relatively simple transaction path. What's more, utilities that look at transit can help cities achieve their own objectives of leadership by example. By ending the purchase of diesel buses, stopping fossil fuel in infrastructure investments today that just become stranded assets and liabilities tomorrow. This bus is in Louisville, Kentucky where the general manager is a veteran of the business, Barry Barker, a business-minded executive with a commitment to sustainability and community engagement. Mr. Barker managed to buy his first round of electric buses using the support of a federal transit administration grant program. Dozens of cities tried to follow his lead, and many of them have filed similar applications. But for the last two years, that program has been oversubscribed by a factor of 10. The sobering result of that is that in that two-year period, we've had nearly a billion dollars of additional investment in clean transit that's been denied. Here's the challenge that cities are facing. Clean transit buses cost 50% more up front than their diesel alternatives, but they also come with a 500% improvement in fuel economy topped off with additional savings in maintenance and operation that actually give them a lower cost overall. That's the saving stream that would give you a clue that a financing solution could work. So I went to Mr. Barker and I said, what would you say if you could work with your utility to buy all of the buses that you want that are electric and zero emission for the same price as diesel without taking on additional debt or scaling back your service and sacrificing your performance? The next time the utility had a rate case, there was the city of utility, making, the city of Louisville making that proposal. And now the two of them are working together to explore it. You see, the utility can actually leverage its tariff authority using its business model in a new and different way. It can unlock that potential. I want to describe how it works. Pay as you save is an inclusive financing system allows utilities to draw in large amounts of low-cost capital and devote it to investments on the customer side of the meter that are cost-effective, like big batteries on clean transit buses. That investment is then associated with the utility's meter, and through a terms of service agreement, the utility can recover its costs with a charge on the bill that's less than the estimated savings. When all the costs are recovered, the utility ends its charge, and the asset belongs to the customer. Friends, here you have a situation that allows the utility to participate in the transaction, but also maintain consumer choice and open competition, to align benefits and burdens at the place where the upgrades are installed. The pay-as-you-save system actually has a track record in the field that spans more than a decade, associated with energy efficiency upgrades in the real estate sector. Utility CEOs like Mark Casey, who spoke from this plenary stage yesterday, have reported that when you introduce pay-as-you-save inclusive financing, it results in a surge in investment related to unlock market, unlock market potential that brings in benefits locally, both to customers and to the utility itself. I founded Clean Energy Works after leaving the Department of Energy to accelerate investment, so we've helped multiple utilities both evaluate and implement this solution. These days, you can find working pay-as-you-save programs in Kansas, Kentucky, Arkansas, North Carolina, and New Hampshire. Also, in the last year, California and New York have both had top policy panels recommend introducing pay-as-you-save in their states. I want to go back to the big picture before we close, though, because Verge is about opening doors, opening minds to transformative practical, scalable solutions. And when Van Jones spoke passionately when we gathered here first on Tuesday, he draw, drew to attention the disparity that we can observe in the clean energy economy that he akin to apartheid. I think it's time 
for frontline communities to be at the front of the line for investment. And clean transit is a good business case. It's a great place for utilities to get started, but it's just a gateway. A gateway that allows them to get comfortable mobilizing more investment to accelerate investment in electrification that benefits us all. Maybe I'm a dreamer. Utilities are known for being allergic to innovation, I know. But I can't resist the effort to try. Because here's why. What if it works? What if it works on this kind of scale? We have the opportunity to harness the self-interest of the utility industry to unleash its unrivaled capacity to mobilize capital at a scale that matters and a time frame that makes a difference. And in my view, it can't happen fast enough. But the utilities aren't going to be able to do it by themselves. Many of them are hamstrung by utility regulators on one hand and investment analysts with 90-day earning reports on the other. That's our chance to contribute. That's our opportunity to be good news messengers. How do we engage institutional investors, regulators, utility executives, frontline communities, fleet owners? I'm interested in what you find is your opportunity to contribute to the realization of this breakthrough potential. Clean Energy Works is dedicated to helping you take a next step in that direction as we all strive to answer the calls of our time. Thank you.